Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the colloquium at TFR uh, CAM. So today we have Professor Pravul Chaudhary from ISI Kolkata, and he'll be telling us about uh, Mahalanobis distance and discriminant analysis. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you, Nishant, for your invitation. And thanks to the audience uh, for coming to this lecture. And uh, let me say a couple of things before I start my talk. Uh, this talk I have tried to keep, uh, keep at a level so that it's understandable to students with varied backgrounds. But still, I mean, if you have uh, difficulty following anything or if you have any question, you are free to stop me and interrupt me at any stage. Okay, I like uh, to give talks uh, in an interactive mode, so it's perfectly all right. In any case, the way I have planned my talk, there are three basic parts. So probably I'll stop twice in between to take questions, uh, short, short questions, and then we can have more discussion at the end of the talk. Okay. So uh, now this term, discriminant analysis, uh, this is sort of obscure these days. I mean, when we were uh, statistics students undergraduate, being our undergraduate courses, we used to uh, use this term discriminant analysis. Now we call it classification or learning tools and other things. Okay, so discriminant analysis is essentially uh, classification analysis. Okay, okay. So let me start with that thing: discriminant analysis and the classification problem. Okay. okay. So is it uh, visible to everybody what is written on the screen? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so this is one of the very classic papers written by a very famous, I probably shouldn't call him a statistician because he was not originally a statistician, though he's very well known in the statistics community. He was actually a genetist, a biologist and a geneticist, okay? So it's a paper by Ronald Fisher. He wrote it in, published it in 1936. And the title of the paper is the use of multiple measurements in taxonomic problems. So what was Fisher's problem? Fisher was interested in the taxonomic classification of different species of iris. Iris is a kind of flower, okay? So uh, the problem is like this. If you are a plant biologist or a botanist, of course you look at the flower and then you classify it as one type of iris or the other type of iris. And Fisher was considering three different varieties of iris, iris setosa, Iris virginica and Iris virginica. So if you're an expert in botany or plant biology, it's a problem in that in your domain of expertise, you will take look at different features of the flower and based on those features, you classify it into one of these three categories of species. But in some sense, Fisher was trying to convert it in, into a mathematical or a statistical problem. Uh, sorry, uh. I think there's some button which has Pressed on your keyboard or somewhere. Constant sound. Is it? Is it okay now? I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, I'm not also, Nishant, I'm also not hearing anything because. <laughs> I could hear it. Now it has gone. I'm not hearing anything. I mean, is, is... now it is fine. Now it is fine. Now it is fine. Yeah, now it is okay. But uh, yeah. Nishant... uh, when you said it briefly, I heard something, but it was only for a few seconds. Right. Okay. Maybe there's a connection or something. Okay. Anyway, let me carry on and see if it goes all right. So, Nishant, is it okay at your end now? Uh, it went on for a long time. Now it has stopped. Anyways, uh, please go. Oh, okay. 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 So, uh, so Fisher was interested in converting this biological problem into a mathematical or a statistical problem. Let me explain how. So Fisher's idea was, Fisher will take some measurements on these flowers. For example, their sepal length and sepal width, petal length and petal width. And based on these measurements, he was thinking about making some kind of a mathematical rule or a formula that will help him to classify uh, these different uh, flowers into different categories. So for example, uh, it's like that uh, you develop a rule, mathematical rule or a formula and uh, you implement it on your computer. And then when you have a new flower and you want to classify it into one of these three categories, setosa, virginica or versicola, you just input the measurements corresponding to that color that you have in your hand and the computer 
based on your formula or mathematical rule will tell you whether it is setosa virginica or virginica. Okay. Now, of course, whatever rule you make, uh, it might make some error sometimes. Now, that is true for a human expert also. Okay. It's not true that a botanist or a plant biologist will be always perfectly correct. Even a doctor is all not always perfectly correct in making a diagnosis. Okay. So there are all these issues that what will be the error and uh, how much error will be making, uh, you will be making in the process. But anyway, this was the basic idea that Fisher had. And in some sense, this is probably the earliest example of a statistical or machine learning or an artificial intelligence problem. Okay. The most classic example. In fact, if you take any uh, standard textbook on AI or machine learning, uh, this is and uh, open the uh, chapter on classification. This is the, usually the example that is given as a demonstration. Okay. So that was Fisher's problem. And Fisher was trying to develop a mathematical rule that will be applied on these different measurements on uh, Irish flowers. And uh, then uh, uh, the, class, uh, the classification result will be produced by that formula or the mathematical rule. Of course, in order to develop that rule or mathematical formula, uh, you need to have some data. And uh, usually we call that something like a training data, just like a botanist or a plant biologist need to learn it based on experience. Okay, So uh, the botanist will probably go and look at different flowers, several, uh, several copies of the flower, and then get himself or herself trained. And uh, similarly, uh, this uh, machine learning or AI tool will also get trained by some data. And then, uh, then in future, when a new flower will come, you will take the measurements on that flower and then those measurements will be given as input to that uh, uh, machine learning tool. And then the, the machine learning tool or uh, AI tool will produce some outcome as, okay, this is to be classified as Virginica or this is to be classified as Cetosa or something like that. Okay. So this is problem number one. And this was Fisher, who was doing it in 1936. And the paper came out in this journal, Annals of Eugenics. This journal doesn't exist anymore. And uh, this eugenics has become a controversial issue now. And uh, so, I mean, this is uh, something that existed only in the past. But uh, the journal, uh, these old issues are still available in the net. And one can download this paper. OK. Now, the next problem. Now uh, comes Mohalanovich distance. Okay, now you see Mohalanovich's paper uh, on Mohalanovich distance uh, that also uh, appeared in 1936 and it appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in India. This Proceedings of Nas National Academy of Science or National Academy of Science, it also doesn't exist anymore. It is the predecessor of what we have today as Indian National Science Academy. So National Academy of Science in those days were located in Calcutta uh, in West Bengal and then uh, it, uh, now it is Indian National Science Academy, which is located in Delhi. So it is the predecessor of that. And it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy. And title of the paper was on the generalized distance in statistics. Now the background story is this. Mohalal Nabish met Nelson Arnolden in the 1920 Nagpur session of the Indian Science Congress. Now who was Nelson Anandel? He was actually uh, an anthropologist. And at that time, he was uh, in charge of the Indian Museum in Calcutta. And being an anthropologist, he was interested in measurements related to Anglo-Indian population in India. So Anandal asked Mohalanovich to analyze anthropometric measurements of Anglo-Indians in Calcutta. And this analysis of this data uh, by Mohalanovich eventually led to the development of the Mohalanovich system. So this is the brief background. Now, so you see, the two problems are very different. There is no obvious connection between what Fisher was doing and what Mohalanovich was doing. One problem was in taxonomic classification, and the other problem was in the area of anthropology and anthropology. Okay. And uh, though Mohalanovich and Fisher were very good friends, and they, Fisher actually visited India several times. And in those days, traveling was not so easy. Fisher actually came by ship several times to India. Okay. Uh, there, I mean, there was no uh, traveling of by year in those days. Okay. It was mostly traveling by ship. And, uh, uh, but uh, as we'll see now that the, the two problems are deeply connected at some fundamental level. 
But before that, let us see what is Mahalana. Let us give the mathematical formulation. Okay. Uh, so suppose we have a probability distribution, and I will assume that you know the basic knowledge. You have the basic knowledge of probability distribution. So suppose we have a probability distribution or a population with mean, mu, and some dispersion sigma. So it's a multivariate distribution. So both Fisher and Mahalanovich, when they had the measurements, the measurements are multivariate. For Fisher, there are four basic variables, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. For Mohanovich, there are many, many variables because these anthropometric measurements on skulls on, or other parts of the body of Anglo Indian that involve many variables. And so uh, it's a multivariate uh, setup. And in the multivariate setup, you have the mean mu and the dispersion sigma, and that distance square is defined like. For an observation x in the same space, the distance of x from that population is defined like this. So it is, so if you think of x minus mu as a column vector, sigma is a square symmetric matrix because it's a covariance or dispersion matrix, and that's the uh, formula. Now it looks uh, very complicated uh, because you have you may ha have to compute the inverse of a very large dimensional matrix if you have too many variables. But uh, it's not so really, okay? So what happens is that you don't compute it uh, like that. You usually try to solve a system of linear equation, which is much more efficient. And effectively in the process, you invert the matrix. And there are other efficient algorithms also for doing that. If I have time towards the end, maybe I'll briefly discuss that, okay? Now, this was Mohalanovich's distance and Mohalanovich used that to define, it's like if I have an individual, an individual Anglo-Indian, what is the distance of that Anglo-Indian from say another population of Anglo-Indians or say the English population or the Indian population, something like that. Okay, so this X is an individual and this mu and sigma refers to a whole population and how far apart that individual is from that population was what Mohanabish was trying to measure. And this is the square of the distance. So uh, if you want the distance, you take the square. And you can, it's a very simple exercise in, uh, uh, Algebra to show that it's a proper distance. Okay, uh, this uh, for any two points in the Euclidean space, uh, x and mu, this is the proper distance. If sigma is a positive definite matrix. Now Fisher's formula or the mathematical rule. Let me show you the next picture and then I'll come back to this. So uh, one question. Uh, yeah, sure. So in the previous slide, uh, so there's a population, if I want to compute this uh, distance, you mentioned that I would have to invert this matrix sigma, but there are some other efficient ways of doing it. Yes. But I also need to know mu and sigma. Now, if I'm analyzing a population- yeah, So that is what is coming from the data that you have. So you always have some data from which you compute the mean and dispersion. It's not really the, a population is based on a sample from the population in practice, but sure. ideally it is defined like that. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. okay. I have also I have also a question. Yeah. So regarding the first problem, so there you are uh, you had some input variables like four input variables, and you wanted to classify that uh, whatever species they belong to. Setosa but, or Virginica or yeah, yeah. like that. But uh, then you are trying to basically do a AI algorithm and uh, make a program. And, so Fisher's so, formula is a very simple exam of, uh, example of an AI algorithm. Yeah, but, uh, but for that, don't you uh, beforehand need some correlation that whatever input variables you have taken, those are related to the uh, the the species different. Yes, 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 of so course. You had and that, that, is, uh, that is coming from the knowledge in biology. I see, I see. So you have this assumption yeah, in yeah, mind. Yeah, of course. Okay, because okay. when you look at these iris flowers, the botanists or the plant biologists know that uh, for setosa and virginica, the sepal length and, for example, setosa is much smaller or much bigger. I don't, I forgot. Okay. So one variety is much smaller than the other. Okay. So their sepal length, sepal width, and petal length, petal width will be different from another variety. I see, I see. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thank you. So that is come from the uh, domain knowledge or domain expertise, like to call it. Okay. 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 So let me now go to that picture. Okay. So uh, suppose I have 
only two variables. So I can plot it in a two dimensional space. And suppose uh, I have all these uh, uh, observations and they are coming from two different populations and say these, are, this is what, these observations in blue are coming from one population and these observations in green are coming from one population, okay? So when I plot them, so you see there is an overlap between this green and the blue. They are not perfectly separate, okay? Now in future, I'll probably have one observation, either this red dot or this red dot, and then I want to classify it into either the blue population or the green population. So Fisher's linear discriminant function that Fisher developed, that is really like a line like this, and the Fisher will classify one, uh, the observation or that particular case into green if it falls on this side of the line, otherwise it will be classified into the blue population if it falls on the other side. Okay, that was Fisher's idea. And let me now go back to the mathematical formulation. So this was Fisher's linear discriminant function. Now you see, uh, because uh, you have x there and the x is appearing uh, once uh, on the only on the left and on the right there is the, this constants mu one and mu two. So it's clearly a linear function of x. So that is why it's called a Fisher's linear discriminant. Now, the question is, how did Fisher come up with this linear discriminant function? Why did Fisher choose that? That is the story that comes in the next slide. Now, I will first tell you something that is very uh, crucial in understanding the connection between Fisher's problem and Mahalanobis's problem. So this Fisher's linear discriminant function corresponds to the separating hyperplane that separates the points which are closer in Mohalanobi's distance to one population from the points which are uh, distance to one population from the points which are closer to the other population. That means if I have, so let me go back to the picture. So instead of this Fisher's linear discriminant function, I could do the classification using Mohalanobi's distance also. So for this green population, I will calculate the mean and the dispersion. And for the blue population also, I'll calculate the mean and dispersion. And then uh, for this red dot that I want to classify, I will calculate the Mohalanobi's distance of this red dot from the green population and the blue population using my formula for Mohalanobi's distance. And I'll classify it into the population for which the distance is smaller. Now it's a very simple exercise in algebra to show that if you follow this classification rule, that actually leads to Fisher's linear discriminant classification. Because that quadratic expression that you have, if you calculate two distances and compare them, then you have two quadratic expressions that you compare. And when you compare them, that uh, term that involves the quadratic in X, that will get knocked out and you'll be left with the linear expression. And that is what you are getting as the linear discriminant function. So that is the basic connection. But neither Fisher nor Mohalanovich actually uh, realized that at that. I mean, it's a very simple observation, but they didn't notice. Now, how did Fisher got it? Fisher got it from a completely different approach. Fisher at the same time was working on what is called analysis of variance. I will not go into the details, but what you do in analysis of variance is something like this. You have measurements from different groups, like different uh, iris flowers or something like that. Okay, so different groups. And then you look at something like overall variation in that measurement. For example, I take sepal length, for example. Now this sepal length, Variation in sepal length is due to two components. One variation is due to uh, different populations that you have, the setosa, versicolor, and virginica. And also within one population, there is variation. Because you see that the points are not all degenerate at one place. So there is variation there. Okay. So Fisher was looking at certain statistical problems where he was decomposing this overall variation to components within group variation and between group variation and then looking at their uh, ratios and trying to see whether the two groups are well separated or not. So that motivated Fisher to develop this uh, linear discriminant function in the following way. Fisher's choice of linear discriminant function was motivated by the fact that this linear function maximizes Fisher's two sample t statistic computed from linear functions of the data. Now, what is two sample t statistic? It is nothing but ratio of within group variation and between group variation. So, when you take linear functions of all the measurements, 
you are reduced to a single value. That linear function is a single real. Then you can look at within group variation and between group variation. And then you look at the ratio. And that ratio, Fisher was trying to maximize because it's like that ratio leads to a linear combination of this variable that gives you, in some sense, maximum separation of groups. And that maximum separation turned out to be that uh, linear discriminant function that I have shown here. That's how Fisher got. Fisher didn't get it through Mohanabhi's distance, but it is connected intrinsically with the Mohanabhi. Now, at this point, I would like to mention one more thing. Mohananabish actually did not even develop this distance like the way I am presenting. Mohananabish actually developed it as a distance between two different populations. So here I am giving distance of an individual from a population, but Mohananabish was not doing that. In Mohananabish's work, that idea was sort of there, but it is it, he was not articulating that quite like that. Okay, Mohananabish was defining the distance between two populations. So it is like if you have two populations with mean mu1 and mu2 and dispersion, say a common dispersion sigma, then in this formula, if you replace x by mu1 and this mu by mu2, then you get an expression. And that is what Mahalanabi is called Mahalanabi's distance between two populations. Put it in another words, uh, it is essentially uh, something like if I want Mohananabi's distance of population one from population two, then I take the mean of the uh, population one and look at the distance of mean uh, from the other population, and that leads to the Mohananabi's distance between the two populations. So that is what Mohananabi was doing. But for classification purpose or discriminant analysis purpose, it is uh, more useful to look at Mohananabi's distance of an individual observation from a population. That's why I'm saying it like that, but they are all related, okay. Now, after all these things, now comes a very fundamental question. Now, your problem is classification, not measuring distance. So, well, I mean, what Fisher was doing sounds reasonable because Fisher was trying to form a linear function that gives maximum separation of the uh, two populations in some sense. And Mohananabi's distance was also measuring distance of an observation from one population and from another population and then comparing the distances. But if I do classification based on such distances or linear discriminant function, do I get a good classifier? Now, what, what do I mean by a good classifier? Let's try to answer that question first. Okay. So a good classifier is a classifier that will make very little misclassification here. It's like a good doctor is a doctor who makes good diagnosis. Okay. So if you want to evaluate the performance of a classifier, it's important that you look at how often it misclassifies. That will give something like a measure of misclassification rate. So ideally, if you want to develop a good classifier, your objective will be to minimize misclassification rate. It's not minimizing distance or uh, anything else. A good classifier is one that minimizes misclassification rate. Now comes the question, if I do Fisher's linear discriminant analysis or Fisher's linear classifier, do I get a good classifier in the sense that it has low misclassification rate? Now, this is a question that was not answered very much. Okay. Now, I will come to the answer to that question now. And that answer was in this famous paper by C.R. Rao in 1948 that appeared in Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. That the answer came, you see, 12 years later. Okay. Nobody had a clear answer to this question. Okay. Now, you see, there is a remarkable similarity between the titles of C.R. Rao's paper and Fisher's paper. C.R. Rao's paper says, the utilization of multiple measurements in problems of biological classification. And uh, Fisher's paper has the title, The Use of Multiple Measurements in Taxonomy Problems. So there are a lot of similarity. In fact, this work that uh, C.R. Rao published in 1948, it was a work done uh, uh, under uh, Fisher's uh, uh, supervision. And this was really C.R. Rao's uh, PhD work. But, uh, 
those of you who are familiar with C.R. Rao's work, you know he is more well known for his work on Rao Blackwell or Kramer Rao. And you'll be surprised to know that he did both of these things before he had his PhD. He was teaching in uh, Indian Statistical Institute as a teacher, and there are some students who are asking him questions. And in order to answer those questions, he developed those the two famous results of, uh, in statistics. One is the Rao Blackwell theorem, and the other one is the Kramer Rao work. Anyway, so this is essentially C.R. Rao's PhD work. And C.R. Rao was working on a specific problem that was again related to anthropology to some extent. So Rao considered the problem of classifying human skulls recovered in archeological excavation into Iron Age and Bronze Age. And that was in the Anthropological Museum in Cambridge where he worked. Okay. So what was C.R. Rao's result? So here is C.R. Rao's result. The linear discriminant function has base risk optimality for Gaussian class which differ in the locations but have the same dispersion. Now, what is base risk optimality? Now, this is a technical term that is used in machine learning, AI, as well as in statistics. All that it means is this base risk is essentially misclassification rate. So, suppose I have only two populations. So, when I classify an observation into one of the two classifications, I can make two types of errors. Either the observation is coming from population one and I classify it into classification, uh, population two, or it's coming from population two and I classify it into uh, population one. So for any classifier, even for a human classifier, uh, there are two errors. And these two errors or error rates, the, the proportion of time you make misclassification or the probability that you make a misclassification, they may not be same. So what you do is that you take these two misclassification rates and form some kind of a weighted average. Where the weight start is like you have some prior idea about how often one population occurs compared to the other population. And those weights are called prior probability or prior distribution. So those again come from the subject experts or from the domain knowledge. Okay. So this base risk is overall misclassification rate of a classifier. And it was Sierra Rao who proved that. This classifier that Fisher developed, which is connected to Mohananovic distance, will be base risk optimal if the observations are coming from a Gaussian or normal distribution. But uh, actually, if you follow Sierra Rao's proof, uh, you can see that this base risk optimality actually holds for uh, any elliptically symmetric unimodal class distributions, which differ only in their location. So they, they don't have to be Gaussian, it's more general. So I'll not go into the details because originally C.R. Rao's paper was about Gaussian distribution. <clears throat> now you have to keep uh, something in mind here. Okay, so all these are when we are talking about exact values of sigma and mu. Okay, so but in practice you always estimate them from some training data. So there is an error due to that estimation, and that we are not considering in this lecture. Okay, so that will take us to a different level of. Uh, complication and I will not go into that. And that is related to what Nishant originally asked. Okay, So Nishant was asking from where I will get this sigma and mu. They are estimated from the training data. And of course, this base risk optimality is if I know if this base risk optimality holds, if I know that true dispersion and true mu, and if I have a large enough training sample, you can hope that your estimated sigma and estimated mu are very close to that. But there is always some estimation error and that has an effect on that, which we are sort of ignoring in this case. Okay, so I think uh, this is the, so I said that uh, I have uh, sort of split my lecture into three parts. So this is the end of the first part. So if anybody has any quick question or needs any clarification, I can try to respond to that now. Anybody wants to ask any question or otherwise I will continue. Uh, I have just a, um, a cute curiosity. Hmm. Uh, so historically, uh, when you mentioned that uh, this um, linear discriminant analysis as proposed hmm. by uh, Fisher, hmm. uh, he had this, uh, this linear function. Hmm. Did, did he get it uh, from the, like the way we teach these days in the class from the Bayes classification in the sense- No, 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 not at all. As I said, he got it from 
um, uh, um, maximizing the t statistic. So uh -huh. uh, let me get there. Yeah, you see, that is how Fisher got. Fisher uh, did not even think example. about volatile mm -hmm. I see, I see, I see. Uh -huh. It's a very simple exercise. Okay, so you take yeah, yeah. a linear combination of these of Gaussians. Yeah, uh, they don't have to be Gaussian. I so see. You calculate the linear combination of these variables. Mm -hmm. Then you calculate using Fisher's formula mm -hmm. within group variation for that linear function. So when yeah. you take the linear function, that's like a new variable you have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that Z. So right. you uh, take that uh, variable Z and look at their within group variation and between group variation. Take the ratio. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you maximize the ratio, but in the numerator, you have the between group variation. Now that is like a linear function that gives maximum between group variation compared to within group variation. Right. And that gives you that linear function. That's how you got it. I see, I see. It's a very simple algebraic derivation. It's yeah. essentially an application of Cauchy for well, nothing more than that. Yeah. So another thing, so uh, you said in 1948, when the, uh, um, uh. Sierra published that paper about uh, the uh. skulls classification. Uh, so uh, before that also, uh, I mean, is it was it like historically very uh, obvious for people that uh, most of the time they were looking at uh, 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 observations which are mixtures of uh, unimodal distributions? Hmm. Was it quite often? Quite often it was that. Yeah, right. Yes. I what see, is I the see. question? I didn't get your question. No, it's not a question. It's just like so. Uh, most of the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mostly because really they were making plots right. and they could see multimodality and all these things. Okay, uh -huh. and. This is a question that was not asked or even properly formulated whether this linear discriminant function has any optimality property under some appropriate condition. It is only C.R. Rao's work that gives a proper formulation of optimality as a classifier. Yeah, I see. I see. I see. Uh -huh. And then, the, uh, so in the, in the case of the, the skull classification, mm. uh, do you have any plots? Yeah, in C.R. Rao's paper, there are some plots. I see. I mean, I see. You can look at this GRSS paper. It's a long paper with a long discussion. Okay. Uh -huh. so there are many discussions who were asking uh, a lot of questions, and then at the end, CRO responded to that. And uh, so there are some pictures, if I remember correctly. Okay. So some sort of like a so very some summarized data is there for sure. I remember. Uh -huh. that. Okay. So I see. even if the graphs are not there, you can probably look at the graphs yourself because the summarized data is important. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh, so just to uh, phrase it in a different way. So whenever they were dealing with uh, uh, fitting um, uh, data, were they always most of the time dealing with uh, uh, distributions which have uh, elliptical iso? No, no, no. Elliptical symmetry was not in their mind at all. I see. If any distribution they were talking about or thinking about, it was always Gaussian, nothing else. I see. Uh -huh. Either it was uh, numerical work, data analysis with mm. no specific distribution in their mind, or if they were thinking about any distribution, it was always normal distribution, nothing else. I see, I see. okay. At that time, in the 30s and 40s. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and because now we don't even, like, it's always all the time the, the very complicated data sets that we deal with, so. Yeah, uh, and then you bring in all kinds of uh, non-parametric classifiers and such Precisely. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm talking about uh, yes. the most classical thing. I understand, okay, thank you. Okay, I see a question in the chat box. Oh, okay, so it's uh, not for me. Okay, fine. I have okay. a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, intuitively, it seems like this Moholonomy's distance has something to do with misclassification. It's like it's right. distance. You're absolutely right. So it's like if you have two populations, you can calculate the Moholonomy's distance between these two populations. I'm glad that you asked this question because this will come again. Later, okay. So as I said, Mohalanovich originally defined Mohalanovich distance between two populations, not for an individual from a population. So I can define the Mohalanovich distance between two populations, which is just mu one minus mu two transpose sigma inverse mu one minus. Okay, and then if you calculate the misclassification probability under Gaussian distribution, it becomes a uh, the misclassification probability is a decreasing function of Mohalanovich. So more yeah. the Mahalanovich distance, less will be the misclassification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just trying to, uh, yeah, intuitively it seems like if the distance it's a is- a very simple exercise in multivariate analysis. Yeah, yeah. You okay. can work Thank it you. out yourself. 
So you just calculate, uh, it's like, suppose you take two normal populations and you have this misclassification rule, and then, uh, sorry, you have this classification rule and you calculate the misclassification probability of one observation, assuming that it's coming from population one, you pretend that it is being classified into population two and you calculate the probability of that event. And then uh, it, the probability of that event turns out to be a decreasing function of the model. Okay. okay, so let me now shift to a slightly different thing. Okay. okay, so now I'm going to introduce a concept called a database, which is in a, a today's literature kind of a very active area of research. So what is meant by that data, uh, this concept data? Okay, so suppose you have this data which are represented in the two dimensional plane. So suppose you have two variables and because it is easy to draw pictures in two dimensions, I'm always assuming that I have only two variables, okay? But all these concepts are easily generalizable in any dimension. Okay? So suppose uh, I have this data, so these uh, black circles or black dots. And then uh, I look at these points, these red points and blue points, okay? So now if I give you this picture and I ask you, uh, what do you feel is different between these red points and the blue points? Clearly, this blue point is sort of in the interior of the data. Whereas these red points are in the boundary or outline. They are even coming out of the uh, sort of the domain covered by the original data that are represented by this uh, black points. Now, how do I measure this? It's like, how do I measure how uh, interiorly look, how, how, yeah, I mean, uh, how do I look at, how centrally located this uh, blue dot is or how uh, outlying uh, this red dot? So data depth is a concept that tries to do that. So data depth of a point measures the relative position of that point in a given data cloud. So it gives a center outward ordering of the points relative to the data cloud. Now, how do you measure the depth of a point? There are several approaches and I'll talk about a couple of them. So one approach is to consider lines or hyperplanes and the, let me draw this picture. So for example, suppose I want to calculate the depth of this point, this point, that red point, okay? Now I can draw different lines. And then it's like, if I draw this line, then you see uh, on this, uh, for this line, the original data cloud is split into two parts and some points are on one, one side of the line and some points are on the other side of the line. And then what I will do, I will take the minimum of these numbers or minimum of this proportion, okay? So obviously the minimum will be coming from this side. Now I can always, find one line for this red dot so that, for example, this line, so that all the points are on one side. Consequently, the minimum number of points on one side is zero. So that number can be taken as a measure of depth. So if a point is sort of away from the uh, interior of the cloud or even outside the convex hull of the cloud, then I will always be able to find a line uh, in a higher dimension, it will be hyperplane so that I can place the hyperplane in such a way that all the data points will be only on one side and there'll be nothing on the other side. As a result, if I take the minimum of the two and then the minimum will be zero. Now, if I look at the blue dot, because it is sort of centrally located, no matter how I draw the line, you'll see that on both sides, they have nearly equals if the data is more or less symmetrically distributed. So in that case, that minimum value will always be close to half. So for this blue point, the depth will be like half, whereas for this red point, the depth will be like zero. Is it clear to everybody? Okay, that's one way of measuring how deeply a point is located inside a cloud. You can use that to decide whether that point is very outlying. You can decide, you can use that to decide whether that is very centrally located or not. That's one approach. Here is the second approach. Now I compare this red dot and the green dot. So what I do is that I have this black 
points and these blue points. Now, these blue points, I have to actually, it's probably a little confusing. I should have not colored them blue. So, but I have colored them blue because these are the points that are joined with this red point. But uh, it's like, uh, that's not important. So, what I will do is that I will join this red point with all these uh, data points, and then I will get different directions. And I will like, just look at the direction vector. So, direction vector is a unit vector that gives the direction of that line. Now, if you take all these direction vectors and average them, if my point is centrally located, what will happen? These direction vectors will cancel each other. As a result, if I look at the average direction vector and look at the norm of that, that will be very close to zero. On the other hand, if the point is very outlined, and then I look at different direction vectors, they will more or less be aligned because the entire cloud is on one side and the point is outlined. So all these points will be more or less aligned and more outlined the point is, these lines will be more aligned. And so when I take the average, the average will be, when I take the norm of the average, the norm of the average will be very close to one. Now, obviously the norm of all these averages will be always smaller than one. And so that this leads to another measure of depth. So for a for any point, what you do is that you look at the average of the direction vectors. So the direction vectors are formed by joining that point with different data points. And then you take the norm of that and subtract it from one. That gives the depth of that point. So these are two different ways. There are many other ways. And these two are sort of very common. In fact, the one that I am describing now is actually the most common one. From the because of the computational simplicity. If you think about the earlier one, well, in dimension two or three, it's probably not so difficult to calculate the depth. But in high dimension, considering different hyperplanes and then trying to figure out how many points are on one, one side and how many points are on the other side, it will be a computationally challenging problem. So that's not so popular in high dimension. Whereas calculating these joining lines and direction vectors are a lot easier. So this is more common. So now, can I ask a question, please? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So, in the in the previous uh, uh, definition, that is uh, the half space depth. Mm -hmm. uh, any point. So, perhaps I can also define the depth of a point which is not an observation. Yes, absolutely. Right. So it's then, a, if a, a point function is, on the entire space, that is correct. So, if the point is lying outside the convex hull then all then such points zero. will have the same half space depth. They will whereas, the convex hull, the depth is zero. Yeah. Whereas if I go to the spatial depth, ah. uh, That's not if, the case. even if I go beyond the, the data cloud, I will keep getting different, 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 different. Yeah. Uh, and that is meaningful in some sense, right? Because they are not equally outlined. Some are more outlined than the other, even if they are outside the cloud, isn't it? I see. So okay. It depends on who your perspective. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. Okay. So now this gives obviously a very simple idea that if I redraw the picture, so forget about this line now, I still have that line. So clearly, if I look at this red dot and calculate its depth with respect to the blue population and the green population, obviously with respect to the green population, the depth of this red dot will be much higher. So I will classify it into that population. So this is depth-based classification. And similarly, for this one, uh, uh, the uh, depth of this point with respect to the blue population will be much higher, so it will be classified into the blue population. Now, the interesting fact is uh, it's not so easy to prove that, but so I'll just state it. So again, for any elliptically symmetric and strongly unimodal distribution, the depth of a point relative to the distribution is always a decreasing function of the Mohananobis distance of that point from the center of the distribution. So effectively, this depth-based classifier is not going to give you a new classifier. It's again going to give you a classifier that classifies according to Mohananobis distance in this particular setup, when you have elliptically symmetric, strongly unimodal distribution. And uh, this shows that how fundamental is the role of uh, Mohananobis distances. Now, today, I'm not going to discuss multimodal mixture type distribution. I have a paper uh, 
in fact, other people have also worked on that area. They are also under some condition, Mohananabi's distance plays a fundamental role, but there the role of Mohananabi's distance is uh, rather complex. So today I have restricted mainly to elliptically symmetric and strongly unimodal distributions because I thought uh, uh, going to the other level might be a little uh, uh, overstretching because I was not sure about the background of people. But uh, if you understand the elliptical symmetric and strongly uh, unimodal case, then the extension in the other cases is not so difficult. Okay. So this is the second place where I would like to stop for a few minutes. And if there is any question, I'll take questions. And then I go to the last part of my talk. When you uh, classify through data depth, so mm -hmm. how can you say that the classifier will be linear? Well, it, so it is not always going to be linear. If it is elliptically symmetric and strongly unimodal, then it is connected to Mohananabi's distance. And from the connection with Mohananabi's distance, it comes, you get the Fisher's linear distribution function from there. Thank you. But in, in general, it is not true. If the distribution is not elliptically symmetric and strongly unimodal, then the data depth gives you a completely different type of classifier. So perhaps uh, maybe what exactly is strongly unimodal? Oh, definition of strongly unimodal is, uh, it's like, okay. So it's like, uh, okay, uh, let me try to recall. It's like Gaussian distribution is an example of a strongly unimodal distribution. It's like, uh, if you take any section, uh, then you get a, it's like, suppose uh, think about uh, the bivariate surface. If you take any section, then you get a univariate unimodal distribution. Yes, I see. Okay, so basically projected uh, yes. data also it's related to projection. So geometrically, it means that if I have a, a strongly unimodal distribution, then I take any sec section, just like getting in the uh, uh, density curve of a uh, uh, univariate distribution, and that is unimodal. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Any other question from anybody? Okay. Now I'll come to the third uh, point. Okay. So now we are uh, moving forward quite a bit. Just so, one thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, we, we have about four or five minutes. Maybe we can stretch it to by a little bit more. Uh, okay. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. Okay. So this part is getting a little technical. So I'll just quickly uh, go over it. And uh, then, uh, I mean, it's like, I mean, this is the key reference. So what happens when you have probability measures or distributions in infinite dimensional spaces? Okay, then something interesting happens. And this is this uh, paper by C.R. Rao and uh, Varadarajan, where they considered discriminant analysis in uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Now, how do you define Gaussian distribution in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space? Is a, the same definition that you have for multivariate normal that you take any linear function that has a univariate normal distribution. Okay, so you have the linear functions in Hilbert spaces, ah, so that is coming from the dual space, and so uh, they are easily defined. Okay, now here is the key result. Now, two Gaussian probabilities with positive definite covariances in finite dimensional spaces are mutually absolutely continuous. So you have the, so they are mutually absolutely continuous. So you can look at the likelihood ratio or what uh, in measure theory you call the radon nicotine derivative. And then that radon nicotine derivative and likelihood ratio is actually related to the base classifier. That's one result. And uh, that after simplification becomes Fisher's linear discriminant function when you have Gaussian distribution, okay. Now, that is unfortunately not true in infinite dimensional spaces. So in infinite dimensional spaces, two Gaussian probabilities, even with same positive definite covariance operators, may be orthogonal. That means they might be sitting in two disjoint parts of the whole space, or they are mutually absolute. So it's, there is a complete dichotomy. Either they are orthogonal or they are mutually absolutely Now, when they're orthogonal, that means the two probability distributions of the populations are completely disjointly supported. 
So in that case, the classification problem is very simple. Because it's a trivial thing. It's like I should be able to recognize. It's like if uh, one type of flower is too big compared to the other type of flower, then you don't need uh, uh, an expert. It's like, I mean, just the value of the measurement will tell you that whether it's one variety or the other variety. So that is strong separation or complete separation. That is orthogonal. Okay. Now, the question is, when do you have the non-trivial case? That means the two distributions have overlap or they're mutually absolutely continuous. Now, so two Gaussian probabilities with a common positive definite covariance matrix sigma are mutually absolutely continuous. This is a very important condition. If and only if the difference between their means lies in the range space of the square root of this positive definite covariance operator. Now, covariance operator is positive definite. So obviously it has a, uh, it, I mean, it, it's a covariance operator. So it has a spectral uh, representation. So from the, the diagonalization, you have, you can calculate the square root of that matrix. Now, being a positive definite operator, it is one one, but it's not on two in infinite dimensional space. That's a big difference between finite dimensional spaces and infinite dimensional spaces. In a finite dimensional space, when this operator is positive definite, it's automatically on because the dimensions are set on both sides. Whereas in the infinite dimensional case, it may be one, one, but not on. And so mu one minus mu two may not be in the range. But if it is in the range space, then this Mohlanovich distance will be well defined. And that is when the two probability measures are mutually absolutely continuous and then everything they can again falls in line and then it's like you again have the linear discriminant function because if you look at the expression that expression is valid even in infinite dimension provided that sigma inverse mu1 minus mu2 is well defined so if mu1 minus mu2 so if i have a stronger condition that mu1 minus mu2 lies in the range space of sigma then everything is in order so that's one thing that I wanted to point out. If anybody is interested in studying these things in further detail, because this is really an active area of research. Because these days we are increasingly dealing with data which are very high dimensional in nature. So it's like you may have data on 10 patients, but you have taken probably millions of observations of these patients okay, over a period of time. So these are high dimensional data. And usually you study them mathematically or statistically by embedding them into infinite dimensional spaces. Okay. And then this theory of probability measures in infinite dimensional come into picture. Uh, and probability measures in infinite dimensional spaces have some peculiar behaviors as I have pointed out. So, okay. So I will stop here and I will take questions. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, let's thank the speaker. Uh, so we had many questions during the talk, but I'm sure that there are more in mind. So please go ahead uh, if somebody has a question. Yes, yeah, so I have some uh, question regarding the point uh, speakers are raised that if you have those two kind of uh, measuring the uh, depth of the data set, uh, then like in one case, uh, if you place a point far away from the, uh, the data set, it will give zero because you'll have a hyperplane that will have one Some side. Plane. That will have all the data points on one yes, side. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, if you take the vector averages, the averages will increase uh, far away if you go. But that actually depends on the data set. Suppose you have a data set that, uh, that is clustered around some zero, and the, then you, yeah. at a far away yeah. point, you place so one... I have chosen some uh, special examples to demonstrate the point. But if the data set have peculiarities, then the depths will behave somewhat different way. That's right. Okay. So it's not a theorem that I am saying. Okay. I see. It's, I'm not stating a theorem here. So is there any way to like... Uh measure which kind of data set uh, for which kind of data set oh, that is measure. why it is elliptically symmetric unimodal distribution if the data are generated from that is one example where all these things will behave like the way i have drawn my pictures i see right so uh, sort of following uh, shubhajit's question so suppose i'm getting real-time data so sequence mm -hmm. of data points 
and i'm trying to one idea is just to try to measure the mean and the variance and these things and uh, try to compute the data as i mm-hmm. as it comes along but another question is also deciding which type of test to use so is there some algorithm in place which will sort of take real time data and try to guess which is the optimal uh, algorithm to use among the ones available uh, at least say among the three which uh, you have mentioned and try to guess which is the best uh, which yeah i mean it's like uh, i mean i think i mean if you can uh, if you can do a real time computation of misclassification rate you know so every time uh, you make a classification eventually if you know whether you have classified it correctly or not then there is a way okay so as you use a classifier you calculate uh, uh, misclassification rate and then you update uh, something like that you have to do okay but i'm guessing that this misclassification rate would be difficult to compute uh, real time uh, at least from well you can model it you know hmm. okay so you can assume that the data is following some distribution and then you can model it and then it will be relatively easy to compute of course if you be, uh, depend completely on the data and try to compute it empirically it will be difficult you can try to model it somehow so the first uh, this is to nishant's uh, uh, question so for the first uh, uh, thing that is using the mahanand based systems that is uh, straightforward so one can actually compute whereas it's the spatial depth yeah. and the the data depth the uh, two key, see, the two what key happens with the spatial depth and those one uh, the half space depth uh, under some uh, special distribution like elliptical symmetric unimodal distribution then again misclassification rate will be a function of mahanand of yeah but uh, like if i am if i am doing it only for the for the data which is which for which i do not, not have it exactly but then it is difficult yeah so then it then becomes it extremely it extremely challenging and in fact yeah. the codes actually take a long time mm, yes to to run so uh, i have another question in the sense like uh, um so so sorry for going again to non elliptical or the uh, sure, sure. multi modal so if i am looking at um, uh Uh, the two key data a uh, two key depth which is a half space depth um and uh, if i look at the the iso uh, depth curves uh ah, okay uh they will always be convex however uh the if i look the at data the, contours i mean the density contours may not be convex right exactly so, so they do uh, not always capture yes you are right yeah so then however uh um, in your 96 paper 96 or in 99 paper with dar yeah uh, you had a qq plot for your spatial uh, depth uh in which you basically yeah showed... i think you sent me an email okay i didn't have uh, time to answer that because i forgot what i did in that paper so can you okay it's good that you are asking this question did, did you send that email it was my student uh, okay so somebody yeah, sent me yeah so maybe shivan can you please question okay yeah. maybe so is it okay if we if we have the discussion now yeah that's fine that's fine sure okay thank you so shiv shankar would you please yeah so yeah in your qq plot paper so you have uh, so there is a theorem which says uh, that uh, sorry to interrupt but maybe i think this is a very specific question no uh, i should really okay, okay, want to ask it later but anyway uh, let me so, so i think you can probably ask this question quickly okay, so let's see okay go ahead shiv maybe maybe i can set the stage so the question that uh, um, so this is for everyone so the point is that if we know uh, the depth at every point the question is can i know what exactly is the distribution no the answer is no so that is yeah Where, whereas for the is, because this uh, iso depth contours right. don't match with the density contours precisely right? yeah. yeah so now the question is uh, um, if given given me given two samples uh and uh, if i know the depth corresponding to these two samples can i compare the distributions of these two samples is there, is there any way of comparing the distributions so typically in, in yes, this... see again you can construct special examples where 
two very different distributions will have same depth functions. Right. Yeah. So, so there is uh, this yeah. So that that's a, that's a... some restriction like elliptic symmetry or something. Then the answer is yes. Yes, so this is the basis, and maybe if the question is too specific, maybe we can move the discussion to later on. If somebody okay, else has sure. any other generic question, sure. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yeah, there's one question from the audience. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll stop.